Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, bringing the world's top experts right to you. Introducing your hosts, Matt Bodner and Austin Fable. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with over 5 million downloads and listeners like you in over 100 countries. I'm your co-host, Austin Fable, and today we have another incredible interview for you with our guest this week, Tyler Maroney. Tyler Maroney is a private investigator, and this interview is going to be a little bit different. We dig into all the tactics and tools and habits you can form to be a great private eye that you can use in your own life to become more observant, to dig up information, to be more tenacious, start off conversations on the right foot. But it's really an interesting look into what the world of a private investigator looks like, which is something that, at least for me, normal individuals don't get a peek into beyond what you see in Hollywood. But before we dig in, You knew it was coming. Are you enjoying the show and the content that we're putting out for you every week? Of course you are. Do us two favors real quick. They're really helpful for Matt and I. First, leave us a five-star review on your podcast listening platform of choice. If it's Apple, if it's Google, if it's CastBox, if it's Spotify, leave us a review, please. It helps others like you find the show and all this great knowledge. Next, go to our homepage at www.successpodcast.com and sign up for our email list today. Our subscribers are the first to know about all the comings and goings of the show. You have access to exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. And specifically when you sign up, you're going to get a free course we spent a ton of time on, how to make time for what matters most in your life. If you're on the go, good for you. Text SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222, and you'll be signed up today. So let's talk more about Tyler. Tyler Maroney has worked as a private investigator at Kroll, the Mintz Group, and now as co-founder of the private investigations firm Quest Research and Investigations. Before becoming an investigator, Maroney was a Fulbright scholar and worked as a journalist. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Fortune, and Frontline. His new book, The Modern Detective, How Corporate Intelligence is Reshaping the World, is available wherever books are sold. But as Tyler mentions in the interview, we would recommend shopping at bookshop.org, which helps support your local bookstores with every purchase. It was a great conversation. I am a huge true crime nerd, so it was great to get a look kind of under the hood as to how these things are done, especially in the modern technological world we live in. And without further ado, I'll be quiet and let Tyler do a little bit of the talking. Here's our interview with Tyler Maroney. Tyler, welcome to the Science of Success. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you making the time. It's interesting. You know, the world of private investigating has been something that has always intrigued me. So I'm excited to dive in. And we're here to discuss your book, The Modern Detective, How Corporate Intelligence is Reshaping the World. But before we jump in, I'm very curious, and I'm sure there's a number of audience members that are, but how does one even begin a career in private investigating and kind of making a name for yourself in the industry? How did it all start for you? Well, I got quite lucky in the sense that I had been a journalist for about a decade when I met somebody who worked at the world's most famous corporate private investigations firm called Kroll. And I met this person socially. And one thing led to another. And it turned out that private detective companies often hire former journalists, especially investigative journalists. And one thing led to another. And I applied for a job and got it. And I say I got lucky because I met somebody. But in many ways, my voyage into the world of private investigations is typical in the sense that I joined it from a different profession. In many ways, we are all refugees from other industries, accounting, the law, law enforcement, the intelligence services, academia, technology, the list goes on and on, especially at the largest of the investigative firms. The most valuable teams of investigators are those that bring different skill sets. And mine was investigative journalism. You know, it makes me think of kind of in the typical spy movie or like a Mission Impossible, there's five members of the crew. Every crew member's got their own specialty. It might not be explosives, but accounting in this case adds a lot of value to particular cases, depending on what the goal is. Yeah, it's true. You know, in the movies, you've got the tech geek and the muscle and the the (laughs) brain and the charismatic protagonist. But I'm glad you mentioned accounting, actually, because kind of all jokes aside, one of the first big private investigations I ever worked on involved mixing a group of private detectives 
with a group of forensic accountants. We had never worked together before. And it was an internal investigation to try to show that employees had been stealing from a travel agency. And we walked in the door thinking that we knew exactly how to crack this case by interviewing the right people and using our charisma and our talents at speaking to people. And we didn't really get very far within the first couple of days. It was only when the accountants started showing us spreadsheets from their analysis of expense accounts and vendor payments from within the company that we developed some real leads. And they were able to pick up pretty quickly with their Microsoft Excel talents, some patterns in the data that we just would never have seen. And it was one of my first lessons as a private detective is being able to work in collaboration with with others who have talents that you don't have and being able to rely on them. Yeah, I think teamwork and really putting your ego aside and kind of saying my skill set might not be the best way to crack this case and taking a back seat and sort of learning from someone who might have that skill set is key and solving really any goal. I'm curious too, how do you make a name for yourself in the industry? I mean, you mentioned Kroll, where you work now. Is there a web of private investigation teams that are well known, maybe not to the common man, but to some of these larger organizations and groups that might be in need of these services more frequently? There are, and uh, that's a valuable way of developing business for yourself and your own reputation. But it's interesting you say, how do you make a name for yourself? Most people in the business, I think, are trying to avoid that in the sense that they are keeping their egos out of it because so much of the work that we do, like the work that lawyers or accountants do, for instance, or even law enforcement officers and intelligence operatives, is very confidential and it's very private and it's wrapped in the secrecy or at least the privilege of legal proceedings. So there are many, many cases that are written about in the news that involve the private detective, but nobody knows that. And the private investigators are fine with that. I mean, if you have a giant ego, in many ways, it's the wrong profession for you. But I'm glad you brought that up because that thinking is contributed, that thinking did contribute to why I wrote my book, because I felt that there was an opportunity here to exploit the fact that the work we do is so fascinating and so global and so fun, but very rarely highlighted. And so I spent some time putting my journalism hat back on and reaching out to private detectives I know around the world or was introduced to and getting their permission and their client's permission to tell me eight or 10 stories about the work they did that would try to highlight the value and the crucial role they play in global commerce and disputes. And in that sense, I was lucky enough to get just enough people to agree to contribute to this book which again is designed to kind of tell the stories of what happens behind the headlines. And I definitely want to dig into some of those stories, obviously without giving too much away, we'll leave some mystery for the book, but I'm curious, you know, you talk about the ego and the inability to kind of openly talk about a lot of this information that might later, the outcome may be public, but the process, you know, you really can't let people know you're involved. What's that line look like? And is it often blurry? I mean, if a company's using, a private investigation firm to gather information. For the example you used earlier when they thought that there was some stealing from employees within the company, why wouldn't they just go to the police? And how is that line kind of blended between private investigation work versus maybe detective work? And also how much these organizations may publicly state that they've elicited services like your own? It's a great question. And it's something that I learned only when I joined the profession. The easy answer to why we are called in by companies to do what we usually call internal investigations as opposed to law enforcement is that in many cases, the alleged bad acts, whether it's a crime or a fraud or an an ethical lapse or whatever the misconduct might be, is not proven yet. And there is simply not enough evidence that what the rumor is or whatever the tip that came over the anonymous hotline was to the company had any heft to it or any muscle. So in many ways, what our job is, is to come in and work usually with the general counsel's office or the outside counsel, so the lawyers who are hired by a company or an NGO, to see if there's a there there, so to speak. And that involves collecting internal documents, 
interviewing people both inside and outside the company and being able to assess whether or not there is a threat to the company, whether it's a cyber attack or a theft of assets or the misconduct of employees within a company mistreating other employees. And what often happens in those scenarios is if we develop evidence of some kind of wrongdoing, we then take our findings and we go to law enforcement. So there are a number of opportunities where I and my team will go and meet with the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office or District Attorney's Offices or regulators and simply present what we have found at the direction of our client because they really want this resolved. Now, having said that, I will just add one twist to this, which is the other advantage for companies to hire private detectives as opposed to calling the cops is that they can direct that investigation. If you call law enforcement, they are going to do whatever they need to do, however they need to do it. Not that they will do things that are unacceptable to the company, but they will do the investigation however they see fit, as they should. But working with a team of private investigators, we can work with the company to try to figure out what's really going on. And if, in fact, the answer is nothing, that no one has put their hand in a cookie jar, then hopefully they'll pay our bill and off we go. It's so cool to hear you talk about this. I mean, for you, I mean, you have a very even keel to your voice, but I'm sitting here smiling because this just sounds like so much of the things you see out of movies and out of the shows. And I know that all of that's very fictionalized, but I do want to bring up one case or one. And so we've talked about why a company would not call the police, maybe would come to you for help with an investigation. On the other side of that coin, I'm curious as to, is there ever a case where a company may not want to know certain tactics that were used to get to a certain conclusion? I think, again, way too dramatized, but the show Billions, the main hedge fund leader there, Bobby Axelrod, has this investigator who digs up all sorts of things for him. But there's many instances where it's like, how do you know this? And the guy's like, do you really want to know? You know, So is there ever a case? And of course, again, I preface that with obviously very, very dramatized, but What's that line there too? I mean, is there any instance where someone might just say, here's the outcome, here's what I want, and they are not very interested in how this information may have been obtained? Or is that just stuff that Hollywood puts in there to make a good thriller? No, that's very real. And I will say that my firm makes a real effort to be very transparent with our clients because in most cases, we are collecting information that might lead to some kind of legal proceeding, which means it's actual evidence. And so we want to make sure that that food chain of collection, so to speak, is tight and it's accurate and it's clear because you don't want to get the goods and then be told that you can't use them because the way you obtained it was somehow corrupted. It's not uncommon for clients to hire lawyers who then hire private detectives or hire private detectives without their counsel and simply say, get me the answer to this question and use whatever tactics you need to do. Now, my advice is that that's a huge mistake because nearly everyone who does the work that I do and we do outside of the United States is not managed or trained or regulated in any way. To become a private detective outside of the US, in most countries, you simply are one because you declare yourself one. And what this means is that in many cases, people who come out of law enforcement or the intelligence services who have very specific, fascinating skills, bring those skills to the private sector where they don't necessarily apply. For instance, in the United States, you are not allowed to pretend to be somebody you're not when you're doing an investigation as a private detective. You are not allowed to create a fake company and approach somebody under the auspices of doing some fake deal with them using this kind of deception. I write about this in my book. There are very clear legal lines around that. And that doesn't mean that there aren't situations where we can be creative about how we approach people. We can talk about that in a little while. But the real pitfalls of that deceptive approach is that you end up being known as the rule breakers. And in many cases, committing crimes. I mean, probably the best example in recent years are the work that was done by a a firm called Black Cube, which is staffed with former intelligence operatives who worked with the lawyers on behalf of Harvey Weinstein, the disgraced film executive. And they were engaged in pretending to be people and setting up fake companies and using deception 
to try to trick some of Weinstein's victims into handing over information or otherwise discrediting them. Now, look, there are plenty of people around the world who want a private detective who's going to use those tactics, but those are not the clients that most of us in the industry, hardworking professionals, well-credentialed, work for. That's a great example. And I've got to bite. You let it out there. So you mentioned creative ways to approach people if you're not going to pretend you're somebody else or pretend to be doing a deal. Obviously, we want to leave some mystery for the book. We do want everyone to go out and buy The Modern Detective. But can you share with us a story, maybe one from the book that's got a really nice little spy twist to it? Sure. So I'll actually give one that's not in the book that is similar to one in the book that involves investigations into counterfeit goods. Now, this is a very common assignment for especially the larger private investigations firms because companies that manufacture apparel or high-end jewelry or even pharmaceutical goods often hire lawyers and private detectives and accountants and others to try to figure out where their counterfeits are being sold, where they're being shipped, where they're being manufactured. And this is a huge industry because there are so many people out there who want to take advantage of luxury brands in particular and create fake goods and sell them because it's so lucrative, number one. And two, because law enforcement has not caught up with that as a crime yet, meaning if you're caught with a small amount of street drugs, you could spend decades in prison. But if you're caught with some counterfeit pharmaceuticals or Gucci sunglasses, you might get a slap on the wrist and not see any jail time, but there's still a lot of money to be made. And that door is closing pretty quickly. So the reason I bring that up is because it's not uncommon for private detectives to go undercover in the sense that they are acting like, say, consumers. So there are a number of cases where I have gone into luxury watch retailers and ask questions about watches and looked at different watches or pharmaceutical goods or clothing. And the idea is to get your hands on as much of this product as possible because in many cases there are clues that you already know that your client, i.e. the manufacturer, has given you to help you identify whether the goods are counterfeit or not. For example, serial numbers or the font, the typeface of the boxes that goods are carried in. And so you want to be able to go in and examine as many of them as possible and also ask questions of the middlemen and the clerks, some of whom were in on the counterfeiting, to develop as much intelligence as you can. Because if you were just to walk right in the front door and tell everyone exactly who you are and what you're doing, you probably wouldn't get very far. We've all heard for years that it's important to have a diversified portfolio, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you know, that sort of thing. But if you've ever looked at a breakdown of the most successful portfolios, you'll typically see a diversified set of real estate. So why isn't it one of the first asset classes you consider when you're looking to diversify? Well, simple. It hasn't been made available to investors like you and me. Until now, that is, thanks to our partners at Fundrise. They make it easy for all investors to diversify by building you a portfolio of institutional quality real estate investments. So whether you're just starting to invest in real estate or looking to add more, our friends at Fundrise have you covered. Here's how. Fundrise is an investing platform that makes investing in high quality, high potential real estate as easy as investing in your favorite stock or mutual fund. Whether you're looking to add stable cash flow via dividends or prefer long-term growth through appreciation, Fundrise They've got you covered. To date, Fundrise manages more than $1 billion in assets for over 130,000 plus investors. Since 2014, the Fundrise platform has averaged 8.7 to 12.4% annual returns, and investors have earned more than $79 million in dividends alone. Start building your better portfolio today. Get started at Fundrise.com slash SOS, that's capital S, capital O, capital S, to have your first 90 days, wow, that's a long time, of advisory fees waived. That's Fundrise, F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash SOS to have your first 90 days of advisory fees waived. Fundrise.com slash SOS. 
so what does that conversation or that flow look like? So you're hired by the company to basically bust these retailers that might be selling counterfeit goods. First of all, are these major retailers or are these kind of smaller independently owned shops? And then secondly, when you find this information and you're relatively certain that the font on the box doesn't match or the serial numbers aren't correct, what happens to that information after that? In answer to your question about where are we going, it's really a mix. Sometimes it's going into a retail luxury store, and other times it's walking into a corner deli or a bodega. And then it's being able to go in and look around and see what's happening and get a lay of the land because you know that, say, there's some product that's being sold out of a certain store. And you might combine some conversations with the clerks and the owners and the cashiers with some surveillance on the back of the store, watching the product being brought in. And you're taking down, for instance, everything that you can learn about trucks they're moving in from license plates to models to the people themselves who are driving the trucks. Now, this is not to suggest that everybody in that supply chain is involved, but it will help you develop clues as to where product is coming from and chasing it all the way down that food stream. So you might start with a bodega and end up in a warehouse somewhere on the waterfront and realize that that's only one out of 15 steps that's going to take you back to a plant in Costa Rica or Vietnam or Tennessee. It's so fascinating. I mean, it's just so cool. But have you ever, and it's okay if you can't answer this question, but has there ever been a time where someone has asked you if you're a private investigator, you've been reviewing these counterfeit goods and someone kind of gets a little bit suspicious? And if so, what's that look like? Not in the context of a counterfeit case, but there are many situations where I will use full disclosure and humor to try to get in the door. I had this very clear memory one time of showing up at the house of a witness, someone we thought would have very valuable information for us. We were working for a guy who'd been indicted for insider trading, and it looked like the government's case was pretty weak. And so one of the things we were doing is interviewing people. This was actually also in the healthcare pharmaceutical space, interviewing people who worked with him in the past and had been sources for him and knew his world. And we were doorstepping, as we call it, which means showing up at people's houses unannounced. And I knocked on this woman's door and I was wearing a suit. I looked very formal. And I said, hello, ma'am. My name is Tyler Maroney. I'm a private detective. And almost before I finished the word detective, she burst into laughter because she didn't believe me. She thought I looked like a door-to-door vacuum salesman or something. (laughs) Heck of a vacuum pitch. Yeah, exactly. And then I laughed and then she laughed and I said, no, really, I'm a private detective. I can prove it. And I pulled out my business card and I asked her to Google me and she did that. She kept her screen door closed and did her little due diligence on me as I stood there like an idiot. It was cold, actually. It was in the middle of the winter. And finally, when she was convinced that I am who I said I was, she invited me in. And we laughed for another 10 or 15 minutes about how ridiculous it was that I showed up Sunday in the dark wearing a suit telling her I was a private detective. It's almost because it flew so fast and hard in the face of what she had expected a private detective might do and how we might behave that she was willing to talk to me. And I acknowledge that that doesn't happen very often, but those are situations where being made, so to speak, although I made myself very intentionally, worked to my advantage. So let's zoom out a little bit now. I know that the format of the book is kind of story and then a little bit of a lesson behind it, but what are some of the overarching key skills that private investigators must have? Obsession, anxiety, paranoia. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No, in all seriousness, I think that it's a mix of truly refusing to take no for an answer, meaning being willing to look under every rock for information. And then if there's nothing under those rocks, then go out and find other rocks. And if you have to make rocks and then look underneath those rocks, one, two, but to be more practical, it's your resume, right? So the assumption is that FBI agents are great private detectives or former police detectives are great private eyes. But one of the things I've learned is that many people who come out of law enforcement don't really enjoy the job or may not be as good at it as they had hoped because their prior profession required them to 
catch bad guys, right? So you were often building a case against criminal behavior and testifying to that effect. But I would say that I don't want to say the overwhelming majority, but a huge percentage of our work is not designed to root out criminal behavior. It's much more nuanced than that. And by way of example, I can describe how we're often hired by presenting companies kind of a dispute. And that dispute might be over a patent infringement of a technology, or it might be over a breach of a contract. And it doesn't mean that it raises to a level of criminal behavior. And that really requires you to understand, and this goes to the answer to your question, what your client really wants and how you can find that information. And the how is one of the things that I really wanted to build into this book. It's the tactics, it's the methodologies, because each chapter describes not just who the client and who the private detective and who the subject is, usually some bad actor or suspected bad actor, but how we got that answer. And one answer to that is what I just described, which is being able to walk into scenarios, in many cases, dangerous scenarios, but still be the kind of person who can demand credibility. I have one chapter in the book where I describe walking into the house of a man who had been a witness for the government in a murder trial 25 years earlier, and we suspected he had provided false testimony. And it turns out that he did. And I got lucky because I found him 25 years later living alone, having recently come out of prison. And my bet was that he was of the age where he had decided to put all that criminal behavior behind him and maybe was willing to have a kind of come to God moment for a second and confess his sin, so to speak, which he did. So another answer to your question is doing your homework, right, as a private detective, really knowing who you're talking to, why they might talk to you, and how to elicit that good information. One thing I often teach people in this business is don't ask questions, have conversations. That might sound like a bit of a cliche, but it's something that I've learned even experienced journalists and private detectives aren't very good at because there's often this assumption that the only way to get information out of people is to hound them, is to intentionally interrogate as opposed to interview. And if you can simply get somebody talking, then you're halfway there. It's so funny. I see a lot of parallels here and basically to sales, you know, I mean, to be a great private investigator, you have to be persistent. You have to have experience. You have to be tenacious, creative. But you're not just hounding people, you're starting a dialogue, you know, you're trying to establish some sort of rapport there. And I think you're just listening to you kind of list these things out and these different pitfalls that people fall into. I think it's a lot like any sort of business development function, really. Yeah, I agree with that. Because when you're doing business development, when you're marketing, I mean, my feeling on that, and it's something I do a lot, is not to sell your skills or your company or your reach, but to sell yourself because they're not buying your corporate entity and they're not buying the list of offices that you have on your website. They're buying you and your ability to listen to them and to find the information they need. But to add to your question about what a private detective needs and what skills we use, I would add to that something that I talk about in a chapter in my book called hashing, which is technological innovation and savviness. I mean, increasingly, the work we do takes place online. And this has been true since the World Wide Web was in existence in the mid-90s. But increasingly, we have to be able to find digital information, whether it's out there or it's been deleted or moved or altered in some fashion, whether it's on social media or sitting on a hard drive somewhere. And the chapter I'm referring to involves a case where I went into an office with a very savvy private detective I often work with, who is what we call a computer forensics technician. So his talents are to be able to take the hard drive of a laptop, say, or a cell phone, and remove the contents, copy those contents by what we call imaging the hard drive, and then forensically preserving it, meaning not just copying and paste it, so to speak, but making an exact replica of it so that we can then search it later on a separate drive and knowing how to carve out information that people might have deleted or thought had disappeared forever. And with respect to social media is keeping up with social media. I mean, you may have followed that in recent months, there are a lot of people who are moving off of certain platforms like 
Facebook and Twitter to places like TikTok and Parler and other places and simply knowing what the platforms are and what kind of people operate on them and what kind of information can be found there is hugely valuable to be a private detective. Yeah, especially in I mean an ever increasing digital world. I mean, I have to imagine that's where there's probably two sides to the coin really. It's one side is engaging with the people themselves, but then there's got to be a massive amount of information you can yield just from things that people don't even think about they put online, like post every single day. Mm -hmm. And to use one example, this is not to downplay the talents of amateur sleuths. I mean, we actually take advantage of that often. I often wish that we didn't have the, the strict confidentiality of many of the cases that we do, because I would love to crowdsource more cases. I would love to have 50,000 people out there poking around social media than our 10-person team. One example of a case where we were able to do that was years ago, we were hired by television producers for a documentary on HBO that eventually aired called The Case Against Adnan Syed, which was a follow-up in many ways to the hugely successful, if not the most successful, seminal podcast serial about the case of Adnan Syed, who many feel was wrongly convicted for murdering his former girlfriend in high school in 1999. But I bring up that case because one of the things we decided to do is in addition to using all the skills we have internally, is to take advantage of what other people had done and follow leads on Twitter and on Reddit and to see what other people had done because they had filed their own public records requests with the counties and the police office and had dumped that documentation onto the web. Or they had put out theories that we had never considered. In fact, one of them even made it into the film where we described that there were these impressions on the body of the victim that were kind of shockingly symmetrical and no one had been able to figure out what they were. And although we still have not been able to figure that out, there were some really creative ideas as to what made those impressions, which might have led us towards identification of either the actual killer or someone who knew what was going on. You know that meditation is the single most recommended strategy and tool on the science of success, and that I'm constantly singing its praises. I've been a daily meditator for almost seven years now, and I highly recommend starting your meditation practice. And that's why I'm so excited about our sponsor for this episode, Headspace. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. Headspace is great for dealing with any challenge in your life, whether you're overwhelmed and you need a quick three-minute SOS meditation to reset your mind and body, or if you're struggling to fall asleep, or if you simply want to have a lovely morning meditation with your children. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. I've used Headspace, and I'm a big fan. On top of that, Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, over 600,000 five-star reviews, and over 60 million downloads. One of the great things about Headspace is that it makes it easy for you to build a life-changing meditation practice that works for you, on your schedule, anytime, anywhere. You deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash success. That's headspace.com slash success for a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. This is the best deal offered right now. Go to headspace.com slash success today. It's been a long time, but I've actually listened through Serial twice. It was so fascinating to me. I remember in one of the episodes, they actually retrace Adnan's steps. I believe it was from school to a Best Buy and analyze where pay phones were back when the murder took place. I mean, it was really my mm -hmm. kind of first deep look at what I assumed at the time was real investigative work outside of the movies. Well, it was a groundbreaking podcast for many reasons, but kind of the first true crime slash look into what private investigating looks like when you're nothing but like a reporter with nothing but your sense and a little bit of can-do attitude, I guess. 
I couldn't agree more. And Sarah Koenig, who was the host of that show, begins the first episode by confessing that she is neither an investigative reporter nor a private detective nor a police detective. In other words, she's trying to convince us that she has none of the skills necessary to do what she's about to do, when in fact she proves over the course of the series that she has <laughs> many of those skills. Now, she's being a bit modest because she had been a very well-respected reporter at that point. And in fact, had covered the case, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. for the Baltimore Sun. So it's not like she was just kind of plucked out of obscurity. But to your point exactly, I think what she did well was she realized that it was not only a fascinating story because of the characters and the personalities, but because she took us kind of step by step through this. And I will say that it's one of the things that I love about good media, like a true detective television show that you may have seen. And if not, love it. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, one of the reasons that the first season is so compelling is that Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson play these detectives who are so different. But at the end of the day, they're collecting crumbs and they're mm. swinging from limb to limb to mix my metaphors. And the <laughs> viewers are right along with them as they're compiling evidence towards this big climactic ending. And so it's not only that we fall in love with who these people are, but we're with them on that journey. And that's what I tried to get through in my book as well. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was interesting about really both True Detective and Serial were two pieces of it really, or two things that kind of glared out to me. It was one, I thought it was really cool or interesting how Sarah, when she was talking to Adnan in prison, Even when the evidence pointed to him, she still reported back the facts. It was like she didn't have a slant. He'd say, there was no way I could have gotten to Best Buy and back during my free period. And they'd go trace it out and they'd call and be like, well, actually, barring you didn't hit an accident or any traffic, you could have done that. The other aspect of it too, which was both serial and true detective, is the time some of these investigations can take. I mean, In the example of True Detective, it was years. And with Serial, I mean, depending on who you talk to, the jury's kind of still out as to whether or not Anon was guilty. Does a typical case Mm -hmm. really take years and years? What's the average sort of arc of one of these things? Well, I wish we had years, to be honest with you. But we always have budgets and deadlines. Mm. And both of those come racing up behind us much faster than we wish they would. But hearing you talk makes me think that there's one other thing I'd like to add to my answer to your earlier question about what does it take to be a great private detective or even a not so great private detective is simply to have a kind of contrarian perspective on life. And I think both true detective fiction and serial nonfiction do this because they both begin with the premise that what we've been told may not be true, that the official record may not be accurate. And I think that's something that I'm even learning, having been a journalist for a decade and a private detective for 15 years, is being able to look at a police report or the conclusions of a prosecutor or an article in a credible newspaper like the Los Angeles Times or the Wall Street Journal and realize that it's possible that the detective or the reporter got it wrong, not necessarily because they're corrupt, but because maybe they were fed false information or maybe because they were just not up to the job. So it's something that I learned very early on in the business, which is something that I encourage everyone to think about is to not really take anyone's word for it. And really go and look for yourself, because most of the cases that we've had profound and surprising success on are those where we've looked over the same documents that other people have looked over, but with a critical eye and thought that whatever it was needed corroboration. So I hope that's not too kind of general of a comment to make, but I think it applies not just to my field, but to others as well. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. So there's one thing that I heard in the research before the interview that I want to touch on before I let you go, because I know we are coming up on time. And that's the role that body language plays. When you enter a room with someone like, for example, say you're rooting out the false testimony after 25 years, what role does that initial contact play? When you're looking at them, you announce who you are, you start asking questions. Does body language come into play? And if so, in what way? So I'm actually going to say, this might be a controversial statement, that body language, in my opinion, has nothing to do with what anyone is thinking. And I worry a little bit that we have been affected by police dramas or by 
fiction that that over dramatizes this a bit. And I say that because just think about what we're going through right now. We're living through a global pandemic. And hundreds of thousands of people are getting sick and dying and we're moving around and people are losing their job and there's rampant homelessness. And it's really difficult what we're all going through. And imagine someone showed up at your house, a private detective to interview you, and you had just had a big argument with your spouse because you had just lost your job and they want to interview you about something that happened to you 25 years ago. Well, maybe you're shifting in your seat because you don't really want to be talking to this person right now. And maybe your eyes are darting around because you're worried that the child who has fallen asleep in her bedroom earlier is going to wake up and come down and be hungry. And so you actually have to attend to that. So I would actually be very cautious of that as evidence of somebody's guilt, for instance. I worry a little bit that we think that because somebody is, like I said, kind of darting around or shifting in their chair, that they are essentially physically confessing to something and really think through more whether or not that's quote unquote junk science and if there are other ways to get information from people. This is not to say that it's complete bunk. I think that our hunches and our intuition are valuable tools in this work, but I wouldn't be overly reliant on it. Yeah, no, that's great feedback and a great call out. I'm pretty aligned with that as well. We've interviewed several experts on the show around body language. I think kind of depending on who you talk to, How bought in you are on body language kind of depends on how firmly you're going to stand on that hill. But I do remember in interviewing Joe Navarro, who's a well-known sort of body language expert, he did kind of give the same disclaimer saying something similar to what you said. He had a story about how they were interviewing this woman and they had suspected her of wrongdoing. I think she was involved in a tax scheme or a fraud scheme and they came in and brought her in and asked her some questions and she was kind of fidgeting. She was kind of sweating and she kept looking around and they left the room and they were like, oh, we've got her. Look at her. She's definitely guilty. And they walked back in and right before they could ask her something, she was like, pardon me, officer, do you mind if I step outside? I parked in a 15 minute parking space and I don't want to get a ticket. And the whole thing, their whole mm-hmm. like thought that they had had this case cracked or she was guilty was really her just being afraid of getting a parking ticket. But I've always been a little curious about that. And I wanted to get your take on it just because I feel like in some instances, you can definitely sense something's wrong. You just have to be really careful on what that something might be. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And this applies to many other, and just to keep this within the kind of confines of law enforcement or criminal justice investigations, where we have learned now that For instance, people confess to crimes that they didn't commit. Mm. I know that's impossible for many people to imagine, but it happens day after day after day. Especially imagine you're 19 years old and you've been accused of murder. And I either have to stay here all day in the precinct or I can just tell these guys I did it because I'm terrified. And tomorrow they'll learn that I was 100 miles away from the crime. But what's happened suddenly is that you are now essentially have proven yourself guilty. I only bring up that example to make clear that I think we are sometimes fall into old narratives about Mm. how the world really works, where casting a critical eye on evidence and on information can benefit us all. Well, Tyler, this has been a great conversation. Just being able to explore your world and ask you questions about the world of private investigating is fascinating in itself. And I do want to be respectful of your time, but I've got a couple more quick questions before we let you go. I'm curious, who's your favorite fictional private eye? Oh, that's a good one. You know, I've been rereading a lot of Raymond Chandler novels. I moved to LA recently, having spent most of my life in New York. And Raymond Chandler has a number of private detectives who are hard scrabble, tough talking, classic hard boiled types who you both kind of hate and admire at the same time. And one of the things I love about Raymond Chandler's detectives is that they're so well sketched out. He was a wonderful writer, really literary. Many people consider him to have come soared above the genre as a writer. But I would also add to that an anonymous private detective, a fictional one is among my favorite too, The Continental Op, who was developed by Dashiell Hammett, another great writer of detective fiction. Dashiell Hammett himself was a private detective, unlike Raymond Chandler. And Hammett truly brings to the game experience of having done this work. And so when you read about the work of The Continental Op, and others that he sketched out, you really do get a sense for how this work was done generations ago that has inspired all of us in many ways. 
great recommendations. And we'll be sure to include those in the show notes as well for listeners who may want to check them out. Tyler, last question. We always ask all of our guests, if you could give our audience one piece of homework to go out this week and start doing, what would it be? Towards becoming a private detective, you mean, or doing investigative work? It could be anything. I mean, I think there's been a lot of overlap in some of the qualities that we've discussed here that private investigators have to have that might fit in other aspects of people's lives. So really, it's your choice here as to what the homework you'd like to give the audience would be. But keep in mind, we get emails about this homework all the time. So people may actually go out and do or implement whatever you tell them. So my answer is that whatever field you're in is to go and find that cold case. And I put that phrase in quotes that is always kind of nod at you, whether it's the Harvard Business School Review article or the tweet from your ex-girlfriend or the unsolved murder from your hometown and look at it with fresh eyes. Don't be a cop about it. Don't be a private detective. Don't be an accountant, but just kind of let your mind go where it needs to go. And towards doing that, always get the primary source. And I know that might sound like something that's boring, but it is a way into a case. So if you're interested in investigating a crime that is unsolved, get the police file. Don't Google. Stay away from Google because you will never get out of it. And you will end up reading other people's opinions. I really think that getting the primary source and putting fresh eyes on it, regardless of what that source is, is the most creative thing you can do and the best way into solving a mystery. I love it. You've got me thinking that maybe I'll drop everything I'm doing and go out and investigate a cold case. So Tyler, <laughs> for listeners out there who may want to learn more about you, may want to learn more about the book, where can we go to connect with you, reach out to you, and obviously buy the book? So the book is available anywhere online. I've been recommending Bookshop which is a great resource for buying books that helps local bookstores online, bookshop.org. There's also, uh, of course, Amazon, and it's sold on Target and Walmart and other places like that. Many bookstores are carrying the book right now, but it's, as we all know, hard to get out. So I encourage people to buy it online. I'm on Twitter at, at Tydamar, T-Y-D-A-M-A-R, and also under my name on LinkedIn. I really appreciate this conversation and I appreciate that question. Absolutely, Tyler. Well, it's been fascinating. I mean, obviously you and I have a lot of, we could probably go back and forth on HBO shows that we've both watched or Netflix documentaries all day long. I've always been very fascinated by this world. And so getting a chance to talk to you, someone so accomplished and kind of on the front lines, it's really been fascinating. I'm sure we could go for much longer, but maybe we'll do it again sometime. But I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing with our audience all this great information and giving us a peek into your world, which is just truly fascinating. You're welcome. And you have asked wonderful questions and had a great conversation, just like a classic private detective. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created the show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm gonna give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or if you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, -E to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, 
everything we discuss and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.